Hello, everyone. Welcome to the December installment of the Aim Ahead webinar series. My name is Katie Stinson, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Before we dive in, I'll go over some light housekeeping, followed by some Aim Ahead announcements, and then we'll just dive into it all. All right, getting started. I want you all to know this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted and shared on the Aim Ahead YouTube channel. Also at the end, we will be having a Q&A session. So please submit any of your questions to the presenters in the Q&A function. Uh, also, if you would like to speak during that time, please raise your hand and we'll ask you to speak. Finally, the chat will be used to share links as well as any technical issues. So again, if you have any questions or comments for the presenters, please use the Q&A function. And additionally, whenever you are speaking and you decide to unmute, please just make sure to listen with an open mind, speak with courtesy, be respectful, and give everyone the opportunity to be heard. All right, a few announcements. Our next webinar for the Aim Ahead webinar series will be in February 2023, and there will be a new registration link, so be on the look for that. Additionally, we invite everyone to join Aim Ahead Connect, and we have some new courses in there in which Aiden will actually be presenting on in just a little bit. We also invite you to check out our events in the Aim Ahead events calendar, which can be found at aimahead.net. And let me add these all into the chat. And then finally, you are welcome to visit our uh, website and subscribe to our newsletter. And there we can provide all kinds of updates and everything going on with Aim Ahead. All right, so kicking off with a micro presentation for the, today's installment, uh, we'll have two presenters. And the first one is gonna be Aiden Hoyle, and she will give us a presentation on the new courses available in Aim Ahead Connect. And then after that, we'll have a presentation by Dr. Jamie Smith. All right, Aiden, you can go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Katie. Can everyone hear me, I hope? Can you hear me, Katie? Yes. Great. <laughs> Um, thanks so much. I will not take too much of Dr. Smith's time. I just really quickly want to make sure everyone knows about courses. This is a relatively new feature of Aim Ahead Connect. And so I'm going to share my screen. Um, when you go into Aim Ahead Connect, can, every, can you see my screen, Katie? Okay. When you're in Aim Ahead Connect logged in, you'll now notice at the top um, a link to courses across that main navigation bar at the top. And when you go there, you'll see that we have three uh, offerings right now. Most recently is a course called Unconscious Bias. I uh, just want to show you quickly what the course looks like. Um, when you open a course, you'll see the course description page like this. This particular course has an introductory video. When you'd like to enroll in a course, you just click the enroll button. And this gives you an idea of what the course looks like. And you'll see courses are broken down into modules. And in this particular course, you would work through each module, which you can also pop out in a separate window. Um, and these courses are, um, this course in particular is, is built in an interactive way so that you will have to kind of work through it and do a pre-test or kind of a quiz before each module. I won't get completely into that, but this is how this course is structured. And then when you complete a module, you'll you will click, I've completed the module. Each course um, that we have offered right now is pretty different. The VADSD Data Science Training Program, this course is really more of an entire program that um, was offered at Howard through Howard University for two months um, and we they've let us create this um, put the program up as a course on aim ahead connect and it's a very rich uh, robust program and you can see just how much uh, is in this course around data science in particular around um, advancing health equity through data, data science this is a video-based course unlike the other course i just showed you this course is structured around um, video lessons with experts in the field. And maybe it'll take a second to pop up. Uh, these are streamed in from YouTube. And when they do pop up, you would watch the video and click, you completed this lesson. And that'll mark it. So that's kind of what the interface looks like. I won't go through every single um, offering. I will say that this data science training core portal is a great resource. This is really not 
exactly a course. It's more of a repository. And this resource was brought to us by um, the folks at the Big Data, Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub and the National Data, sorry, the National Student Data Corps. Um, and they've put together this incredible resource that is open to anyone who's a learner or an educator. Um, and they've kind of organized resources into introductory, intermediate, and advanced resource uh, resources and data sciences. Um, so I, I recommend that if you haven't looked at our course offerings, you take a minute to do that at some point and enroll in courses. Another great idea um, is not just enrolling in courses, but you can also, um, excuse me, adopt a course to use at your institution. So for example, if you've got a group of, if you're teaching courses in data sciences and you'd like to use any of our courses in part or in or as a whole with your learners, you can adopt these courses. We can set up a cohort just for your learners that you can monitor using a dashboard. In addition, um, we'd love to hear your ideas if you're an educator interested in partnering with us on offering a course, um, we'd love to hear from you. So that's all of the courses that we have so far, including a couple that we have in the pipeline coming very soon, have been done in partnership with um, the folks in our network. And that should say in my head, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so this is a link and I'll add this to the chat after talking with you. This is a link to a page where you can uh, learn more about enrolling, adopting a course for your institution, or getting connected with us around your ideas for creating a course. So I'm happy to answer any questions you all have, and I will, yes, super fast, super fast. With that, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Aiden. That was wonderful. <laughs> that was such a great introduction to I've the tried courses to be really available <laughs> in Aim Ahead Connect. That's awesome. All right, so now I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Jamie Smith is the founder and principal of JYS Consulting LLC and is also the global head of scientific data for a large research organization. Dr. Smith's experience spans more than 16 years and is broad and deep in designing and implementing real world data studies and promoting health equity using ML and advanced statistics, generating RWE, including through data strategy, global data privacy, data collection patient engagement and outcomes, and leading the integration of innovation tech solutions for e-health data acquisitions and interoperability. For nearly one decade, she led statistical research at SureScripts partnering with various government agencies, including the Office of National Coordinator. Dr. Smith is well published in peer review journals, including Health Affairs, JAMIA, and AGPB, and she holds a PhD in health services research, data mining, and health informatics. So, all right, Jamie, or Dr. Smith, it is your turn to take it away with your portion of the presentation. So I will stop sharing now and please feel free to take over as soon as you're ready. Awesome, thank you so much, Katie. Thanks, Aiden, as well. Can everyone see my presentation? <clears throat> Perfect, awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, today, I um, have the privilege of being able to present some of the work that I have been doing over the past decade uh, in understanding and wrangling e-prescription data. And I actually took a look at the guest list uh, and those participants got some folks from um, SureScripts, which is where the data is, is coming from for this particular analysis. I, I started there over a decade ago, no longer there, but was able to actually harness in um, a lot of talent and um, information and data that I acquired there in partnership with several other entities and also the George Mason University um, Health Administration and Policy, which it now is, is no longer that, just recently got a, a new name under the Public Health Department. But uh, this particular research spawns from my dissertation work and my work over the past 10 years. So I would like to acknowledge professors uh, Kitsantis and uh, Janusz Wojciech, as well as other acknowledgements from SureScript, uh, Mr. Maxell, 
Joshua Ruiz and Walter Clower, who were instrumental in being able to access these data, giving me the permission to be able to use these data, which are data that are really highly proprietary, highly sought after, and um, I, I was able to get the, the chance to use the data and work with these great folks to get this research underway. So today I'll be presenting on a cut of the research. So this is a really broad research project to help address and um, better understand the opioid epidemic. But for this particular audience, I've segmented most of the work to focus more on policy as well as machine learning techniques. So I'll be going over the introduction to the research, my um, the impact on of e-prescribing mandates on provider prescribing behavior, the specific aims, some of the limitations, results, discussion, and um, my future work. All right. So I'll take a deep dive into what is this research about? So we're all aware of the opioid crisis, and we know that it was declared, the opioid crisis was declared a national public health emergency in, in 2017 here in the U.S. And there were several levers pulled throughout this time in order to address the epidemic. We know that between 2017 and 2018, we saw a precipitous decline in drug overdose deaths. So we saw that some of the movement, some of the legislative work, some of the on the ground work was actually coming to fruition to make a positive impact and decrease those drug overdose deaths that were largely driven by opioid drugs, licit and illicit. But what we saw in terms of um, the drug overdose deaths over the past two years as it relates to COVID is a turn, a turn back up. So there was a quick blip down in deaths and then 2020, 2021, and this year, January 22, we saw again the rise in drug overdose deaths now over 100,000 deaths after seeing really a lot of hope garnered by the work of so many people who were on the ground. State level policymakers came together and um, they really tried to take a look at how can we pull our levers internally to start to address this epidemic. And one of the ways that was used to actually start to take a look at how do we impact and decrease the number of drug overdose deaths that, that are happening happening here in the U.S. How do we reduce prescription drug abuse and misuse? How do we prevent prescription fraud is by taking a look at a multi-pronged approach. So we have legal, we have regulatory, we have um, we have the, the prescribers, we have the pharmaceutical companies, and then the technologists. So really everyone and all hands on deck to start to address this issue. But why was e-prescribing important to actually start to dive into addressing this epidemic? Well, one of the things that e-prescribing allows for is the ability to help to prevent and reduce prescription drug and prescription uh, pad uh, the stolen and forged prescriptions that can occur from a loose pad being left on a prescriber's desk, right for the picking for someone who is drug seeking and has drug seeking behavior. So this eliminates that, right? So we now have an EHR system, oftentimes with an integrated e-prescribing e module that will allow for safety and security measures to be able to say, now we need two-factor authentication. You can type in your prescription, use a token to be, type in your, sorry, type in your uh, password and use a token to be able to log in and write a prescription. So no longer having these loose paper prescriptions available, but also the ability to monitor those prescriptions as well. Obviously, because it's electronic, we're now able to actually visualize and see those transactions real time, no longer delay from claims data, for example. You get a chance to see the data as it's coming through. 
So we have the policymakers taking a look at this particular technology as a way to monitor prescribing behavior from the provider perspective, but also from the patient perspective, and then also leveling in the additional layers of safety and uh, security around the writing of prescriptions. But there's limited research on this broad approach across all states. But this was rolled out on a state by state level. So this was not a national initiative initially at least. Later on, and I'll get to that in a moment, later on we begin to see the federal government come in and, and start to play a role. But really this is a state by state initiative. And so there's limited research that has the capability to be able to look at the broad landscape across all states mostly because we know that we're not an interoperable nation yet, right? A fully interoperable nation where we're able to see data from all states coming into one particular location. We haven't gotten there yet. So what's still outstanding is, do we see an increase in prescriber utilization of e-prescribing technology? There are other questions, of course, right, that we would probably like to understand as well. Do we see a decrease in overdose deaths related to these particular mandates? Do we see um, a decrease in, in the drug supply as a result, right? So there are other questions that we can answer, but this is an outstanding question as well, that the data, specifically the data that I had access to, would lend a, an, a, an eye to and be able to answer. So we've got to take a look at which states are actually rolling out these mandates. And so when we think about the landscape, we oftentimes are probably thinking about all oh, these, these large states like California, Texas, or New York. But the way that these rolled out was really starting with the state of Minnesota in 2011. And each particular state rolled out its own particular mandate in a very specific way in accordance to whatever was going on in their state. So we have in 2011, before really ubiquitous use of e-prescribing and EHR adoption. So we've got probably at that time, 20% adoption in the country. Today we're you know above 80, 90% adoption. But then it was very low adoption, but Minnesota was groundbreaking in that regard. They were able to, to harness that momentum and say, okay, we're, we're going to go ahead and mandate that all prescriptions need to be sent electronically. Well, as you can imagine, there wasn't a huge uptake of it because there just wasn't a lot of adoption of the particular technology. You fast forward five years, that was the next time a state decided to say, no, we've got to, we've got to actually take a stand and uh, require all providers, generally all providers, to prescribe um, their prescriptions electronically. This occurred in the state of New York in response to the opioid epidemic. And this one was the first time that we see teeth, what's called teeth, which just means that there's a penalty associated with noncompliance of this particular legislation. This is in contrast to Minnesota that did not have a penalty. And we'll see the differing levels of adoption when we take a look at the next slide, which has our map of um, EPCS adoption, electronic prescribing for controlled substance adoption and utilization. So I'll be showing you on the next slide a map of the US as of February, 2022. And this map is available um, today, right now on the SureScripts website and it's up to date, so it's um, more current than, than my view of it. But this is something that we can visually see where we are. It's a representation and a gradient in terms of the color of the map. And also it highlights uh, the variety of policies associated with each particular state. And so we'll see that now. So here we have the EPCS readiness map. And we have a chance to take a look at what this entire landscape is. How ready is the U.S. for the implementation of EPCS? 
And as we can see here in the state of New York, we're at 85%. And again, this was in February, so it's a little bit further beyond with the iStop Act that requires that all prescriptions be sent electronically. And again, there are um, some exceptions, but there are penalties for non-compliance. This was, again, very groundbreaking for the U.S. to actually take a stance and say, we're going to use technology to address the, this epidemic. This is followed by, in 2017, the state of Maine, and uh, Maine requires the prescribing for all opiates, followed by the state of Connecticut at 70 percent, no penalties for noncompliance. And then let's take a look at Minnesota, who's only at 66%. So even though they had a five-year start on uh, New York, still lagged behind in terms of the adoption. And then when we take a look at the states in the South that do not have a policy at all, we see they have the lowest levels of adoption of this technology. Take a look at for 2022, California was on the roadmap to be um, enacted this year. And then Illinois is on the roadmap to be effective in January of 2023 for all controlled substances. When we think about it from the pharmacy's perspective, the pharmacies were actually already ready to accept these prescriptions. As you can see, 95 to nearly 100% we're sitting there ready to receive the prescription. So what does that tell us? That from the prescriber side, that was really the side that was lagging behind. So really the, the infrastructure was in place from the technology perspective, from the pharmacy perspective, but the prescribers had not yet gotten there. And then nationally, we're at about nearly you know, 98, 99% for pharmacy. And then uh, nearly today, it's about 879, 80% for prescriber adoption nationally. And part of that is driven by the Support Act, which is the federal legislation. So I mentioned earlier about the federal legislation coming in, and that particular legislation uh, is related to those providers who have patients who are Medicare Part D, which is essentially those older, elderly uh, patients who are a part of CMS's Medicare program. And so there is a mandate as of 2023 for all of those providers to be sending their schedule two through five medications electronically. So that's really gonna start to drive some of these numbers and increase in the utilization of this technology. So there's some relevant studies that have taken place from 2019, and that's really, that was the first study. So this is, you know, this is really cutting edge that we've been a part of, of prescribing for, for decades, right? Prescribing has been going on since, since the, the dawn of day. And we only started to take a look at the electronic use of this and the mandates around um, prescribing, even though in Minnesota, again, this has been going on since 2011. It takes us until 2019 to actually start to assess, at least in terms of peer-reviewed research, to assess the impact of these mandates on prescriber behavior. So notwithstanding, the groundbreaking study took place in the state of New York, where this was a small study taking a look at um, two short periods, four-month periods, to observe whether or not there would be a decline in the total number of opioid prescriptions written by these, uh, these providers during the period of time of the adoption of this particular technology and the ISTOP mandate. So in fact, the researchers did find that there was a precipitous decline, a significant decline in the total number of opioid prescriptions following the mandate, and that there were some changes in the provider's behavior. We know how difficult it is to change the behavior of individuals, but this showed optimism potentially for the ability of a mandate to change the behavior of a provider. And then also the potential to perhaps decrease prescription of fraud and abuse of opioid medications. A following study that occurred from Walgreens found a reduction of 17% in the total number of patients with high dose opioids as a result of Maine's mandate. So Maine was the next state 
that I mentioned before, but these are just one off. So you've got New York, you've got uh, Maine, you've got Connecticut even had a study, but nothing that sort of showed this general landscape of what's happening across the United States. And part of that is the difficulty in access to data, again, that is interoperable. And that's the advantage here of this particular study. There was a policy framework that I won't go into today. I'll focus here on the data mining and informatics framework. So my goal here was to identify features that predict decreased prescribing of opioid e-prescriptions in a given year, 2019, based on the following features, provider state, provider specialty, um, and then their past provider prescribing behavior for opioids using the following opioid and, and substances that were prescribed. And these are actually all of the prescriptions that were prescribed during the years 2017 and 2018. So my research question is, does opioid prescribing in the prior years and prescriber demographics predict decreased prescribing of opioid prescriptions in the calendar year 2019 using data mining um, techniques? And so what's interesting here is that before we were using more of at least the, the studies that I presented, we're using more of the traditional statistical methods. And actually, I use an interdisciplinary approach. I use two methods. I'm only going to cover AIM-2 here today, but I use the comparative interrupted time series analysis to take a look at the, the impact of these mandates on New York, Maine, and Connecticut. And then I took it a to a different level as well to look at data mining techniques using the logistic regression, naive bays, uh, random forest, and support vector machine classifiers to predict decreased opioid e-prescribing um, in, in 2019. So I've been talking about this data and how it's so unique <laughs> and my access to the data. And I haven't really given you a good sense of what these data are, and I'll do that in a moment. But I took a look at SureScript data from SureScript, which is the e-prescribing transaction data, US Census data for the population level, unemployment data, as well as income data, all from BLS and the US Census Bureau. So uh, for anyone who is not familiar with SureScript, uh, SureScript is a large health information network that is typically known for e-prescribing and other types of transactions. So whenever you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you need a prescription for drug A, and where would you like it sent? You say uh, pharmacy B, the mechanism that allows that transaction to happen from the point of care to your pharmacy of choice is what SureScript delivers among other Thing. So you can think of it very transactionally here, which is a snapshot from uh, the 2021 SureScript National Progress Report, where we're really just trending e-prescription still. So you can see the growth ac across the network of 1.5 billion to 2 to 2 billion, and then of course beyond when we move beyond 2021 to 22. And then e-prescriptions for controlled substances growing from about 60 million to about 256 million. And so this was the subset of data that I used to start from. So this entire data set to start from um, and, until I sort of to weed out all of the exclusion criteria to get down to my actual subpopulation. But I started with this amount of data. All right, so just, just to recap, before I go into my method, so I'm predicting decreased opioid e-prescribing for 2019 using 2017 and 2018 data, uh, prescribing data, provider demographics, such as specialty and their geographic location, and really taking the traditional steps that we take when we're running machine learning algorithms. I explored the data, uh, pre-processed the data, wrangled you know, all of those data elements, as well as interpreting the results and reporting out on the outcome. So I started out actually with a larger set, subset of prescribers who fit this inclusion criteria. They needed to be active between 2017 and 2018. 
and um, I rolled up the data to the prescriber year level so that I would be able to assess their year over year changes. My primary outcome was a binary flag, right? I'm using logistic regression. You know that from understanding logistic regression, you need a binary, a multivariate um, dependent variable. So my binary flag was to identify e-prescribers who have decreased their proportion of opioid prescriptions in the given year 2019. All right, and so I partitioned the data into an 80-20 training test set and um, took a look at the area under the curve with a threshold of, of 0 .0, 0 0.7, which is your standard for strong performance. Every study, of course, has its limitations. This study is not without them. So if we're looking at e-prescribing data, which of course is the primary data source for this particular analysis, it does not cover providers who only write paper prescriptions. So those folks are not included in this particular study. And this study analyzes e-prescriptions that are electronically sent to pharmacies. So it doesn't take into account whether or not a patient has picked up the prescription. We oftentimes want to think about whether or not a patient is adherent to medication. This does not answer those questions um, and it does not cover that as a particular item. Number three, data obtained from this are again at the provider and state level. I do not use any patient level data for this particular analysis, although the most granular level is the transaction level, which has patient data. I, of course, aggregated it up to the top so that it was presentable for this audience and all other audiences that I use to present these data. Number four, e-prescribing data uh, were obtained from one large health information network, the SureScript network, and does not include any closed integrated system. And then lastly, this does not take into consideration any year-to-year -year changes in the controlled substance schedule, which of course can occur and did occur uh, during um, some of these years. <clears throat> now on to the results. I apologize, I was just giving another presentation uh, for, for a couple of, of hours. So you guys are getting me right at the end of the day when my voice is fading, but hopefully we can continue on. Um, here we have the results of the opioid. This is really just a, a demographic picture of this particular cohort what 2019 looked like. And I looked at this, of course, over 2017, 2018. Here I'm just presenting 2019. And it, it's an interesting look because this is something I think that we we often know and think about, but to see it pictorially is, is always um, compelling, at least for me. So when I take a look here and we see that on the y-axis we have pain and it, I hope you all can, can see the attributed specialty, but we have pain, we have surgery, we have those associated with anesthesiology as well. Here high on the, um, on the Y axis. And we know that there's a greater proportion of their prescriptions going to opioids, right? That's, that's what this shows. But there are a smaller percentage of the overall uh, population of, of specialties, which we expect, right? We expect that the largest groups are going to be family practice, are going to be internal medicine, are going to be nurse practitioners, are going to be physician assistants. We oftentimes think of, well, because they're the largest group, for example, family practice, then, you know, a, the bulk of their prescriptions must be for opioids because they've got su such a large number of opioids, but it actually is a small percentage, it's under 10% of their overall prescription. They just account for a large number because 30% of all providers for this particular um, study were represented by family practice, internal medicine. And then of course, conversely, we have the anesthesiologists and the pain doctors, pain management. We expect that the bulk of their prescriptions would be opioids, but of course it still accounts for a very small number because they are in fact a very small number in this population. 
So let's take a look here at the results. Here we have all four machine learning classifiers. So as, as expected, we, we oftentimes see the random forest classifier achieving the highest precision score, ach achieving the highest <coughs> accuracy as well. And it's no different for this analysis. We see here for precision, we're at 73% for class zero, while uh, class one achieved the highest percentage of recall at 80%. We see that here. And overall accuracy for the random force was superior to all other classifiers at 72%, although, and the remaining classifiers just didn't even meet the benchmark of uh, 70%. That was the threshold for comparison. So random force was superior overall in terms of it being benchmarked against the 70% thresh threshold and um, in comparison to the other classifiers here. What's interesting, and one of the things I love about random forest and logistic regression is the ability for feature selection. You, you can actually do that with the SVM as well. It gets a little bit clunky, but for random forest, at least, we're able to start to tease out what are some of those features that are rising to the top as important features in our assessment of the, the decrease in opioid prescribing. And so it is the prior year's prescribing of the hydrocodone, the oxy, the, the codeine, et cetera, but then also being from New York, so that the prescription originated in New York is, is very interesting, as well as the family practice and um, coming from the, the nurse practitioners as well. So it's, it's interesting to see the state rise to the top as we think about sort of the broader picture of what is the impact of these state level mandates on decreased prescribing, when we see a state like New York rising, that is something that uh, we would hope to see and it was good to see it here as well. The logistic regression results were, were a bit head scratching. And I think part of this is because of, of some of the tuning that, that really would help to refine the, the logistic regression model. But there were some interesting components that came out of this sleep medicine prescribing, which we didn't see here in Random Forest. The state of Delaware, um, which was a forthcoming state for, for um, the adoption of the policies, the mandate. New York there, Nevada is one of the states that was forthcoming. So it, it is interesting to see how the logistic regression fared against the Random Forest regarding uh, feature selection. And so regarding the discussion, just at a high level and um, in summary, we found that the random forest classifier, again, was superior in terms of accuracy as compared to the remaining um, classifiers of interest. We find that the top 10 features were the past prescribing in 2017 of hydrocodone, oxy, tramadol, um, morphine, as well as those, some of those same opioids in 2018, additional features which were really interesting were the state of New York coming through, um, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, helps us to start to understand, well, when we think back to some of the guidelines, the initial guidelines that came out in 2016, the CDC guidelines in terms of how we should think about prescribing, how in particular, those family practitioners, that's where the guidance was, was targeted toward the primary care setting providers, how they should think about uh, positioning their prescribing of, of opioids and controlled substances. It gives us a sense of, well, maybe we should also think about, so maybe targeting those populations is good, but also looking at maybe a, dish, a different population, such as the nurse practitioners, or even um, targeting some of the some of the pain management specialists as well. We know that the initial view of looking at opioids and prescribing took place among dentists. That was sort of the initial look into is there something going on. Um, researchers started to look at dentists first, and, and they weren't looking at family practice doctors. Also, the the logistic regression classifier did also highlight New York and Nevada and Delaware, and Nevada and Delaware are, are states that were trending in the direction of, of 
moving toward the adoption of electronic prescribing mandates. And also there's some clinical importance there as well, taking a look at trending for various provider specialties. And so in conclusion, we found that the e-prescribing mandates were effective. And this is a part of the research that I did not highlight here. It was more of the uh, interrupted time series analysis showed this. But it's useful here in the context of the study to, to understand holistically the picture that was painted through the entire research project that we did find that e-prescribing mandates were effective and at increasing um, the e-prescribing, so the ability to e-prescribe and the adoption of e-prescribing so that those providers could, could utilize the technology for controlled and non-controlled substances. And also uh, had implications in terms of shifting the prescriber behavior. We saw that over time, that that occurred again with, with that separate analysis. But also, you know, there's a myth that you really can't combine or most people don't combine traditional statistical approaches with machine learning and certainly not in the policy context. And I wanted to dispel that here with my analyses. So that was one of the, the conclusions that we could draw from this is it is possible to have this multi-pronged approach to be able to take traditional statistics, to be able to use machine learning and actually start to get clinically effective and clinically um, reasonable outcomes as well as statistical outcomes as um, for, for policy implications. And then just thinking through, well, maybe we should start to think about educating and providing training material on provider prescribing behavior. We know this is already happening at the universities that are training the, the providers. They're getting this additional training. It is now mandatory for, for several programs to start to incorporate um, how to prescribe and how to identify drug seeking behavior. What are some of the ways that prescribers should be looking at prescription drug monitoring programs, PDMPs and checking those. Those are some of some states are mandating that in order to be able to prescribe controlled substances. So this is happening today. And also bridging the gap in fragmented care across multiple patient populations. It, what this actually showed us was that the disparate care and the and the disconnected care that we see in society here in the U.S., where you don't have providers talking to one another, you certainly don't have all systems talking to one another, and so when you have that fragmented care, then you're not able to really service your patient as well, the complete patient as well, and understand their needs. So that's something that came out. Of, of this work. All right, so some of the future work that uh, we are investigating is <clears throat> looking at the impact of e-prescribing legislation. Again, as I mentioned, there's several questions that you can answer, but do we see an impact from the legislation on mortality rates and, and the utilization of opioid e-prescribing? So I didn't cover that for this particular analysis, but that's something that is, is an outstanding question. There are uh, studies that have looked at this on a state by state level, but not holistically across the United States. And then um, what is the impact, right? We're still, we're, we're on the tail end of things, but we're still feeling the impact of COVID. And what are some of the impacts that we found holistically again across the US on uh, e-prescribing mandates and the implementation of those mandates throughout the pandemic. We still saw, just like a sneak peek into this, we still saw the adoption of the technology. We still saw the rollout of the mandates occurring across various states. And as I, as I highlighted on the map, Illinois is, is set to roll this out as a mandate in 2023. So, you know, there, there were certainly some impacts that occurred as a result of COVID, but measuring those and actually understanding what those are is, is something that is an outstanding question. And then, you know, I looked at decreased prescribing. I did also look at increased prescribing, didn't um, move forward in that direction, but 
that I think is an important feature as well. Can we actually start to predict those who will increase their prescribing of opioids? That's something that's a little bit of a different way of thinking about this as a problem, but we do want to know who we believe is going to be over prescribing, right? That is something that is of great interest to the industry. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Dr. Smith, thank you so much for that presentation. That was absolutely wonderful and incredibly informative. Um, we now have a few questions that have already been submitted, so I'll get started with some of those. If anybody else has any questions for Dr. Smith, please feel free to put those in the Q&A and we will get to them in order. So the first one is, could you please briefly describe what SVM or support vector machine is? Sure, I will. So, <laughs> So support vector machines um, create a hyperplane. So when you think about the, your, your positives and your negatives, you've got your data points that are stratified within the plane, within a hyperplane, X and Y coordinate. And so this creates a nice pattern. And it, it is quite complex because they're kernel functions that we're using to actually uh, delineate where this pathway is between your, your zeros and ones. But we're able to, to map that out, could be with a linear function, could be with a, with a different uh, function in terms of its kernel, but it creates this hyperplane that allows us to estimate the distance between our zeros and ones within the model. And so it, it, is, it is a more complex model. It's a model that um, has <laughs> results that are difficult to interpret. It also does allow, at least for the way that I implemented the model, it looks similar in my implementation here to the logistic regression result. It can also give you the feature selection as well, but generally the, the results are a bit difficult to, to, to interpret, which is one of the reasons that I ended up not going with the feature selection approach for, for that particular classifier. Excellent. Thank you for that explanation. All right. The next question, does the population in the study include inpatients or is it only outpatients? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so this is all uh, outpatient data. That's, uh, that's a part of this particular study. Excellent. All right, we have one final question in the Q&A. So if anybody else has any questions, get ready with your hands raised or you can <coughs> feel free to enter those into the Q&A. But this one is, can you please explain how you correlated the state to the policies? Did you weigh the states by size or number of providers who prescribe opioids? So that's, that's an interesting question. So I did that, I did not do that as a part of the machine learning portion. So, and I didn't, I sort of teased the, the interrupted time series analyses, but um, in that particular analysis, I did weight the states by the population, um, in, uh, by the population in the state. And I also weighed the actual prescribing by the pr number of providers who were prescribing opioids. So that is the approach that I took on that side of, of, of my uh, research on AIM-1 that, that I didn't cover, but not for, for AIM-2. Excellent, thank you for that. All right, we're gonna give it just a little bit longer to see if there are any additional questions that populate. But you know, Dr. Smith, I think you've explained everything so well and so thoroughly that that's why we don't have that many questions. Um, so it was a very, very wonderful presentation and so timely given all of the things going on with the opioid crisis. So I'm glad that some work is being done with that. All right, I don't see any others coming in, but thank you again so much for sharing this work with us. It is definitely very influential and just it's so exciting to know that this is actually happening and that we're actually seeing results from the work that you're doing too. Thank all you. Right. All right, I'm gonna share my screen one last time just to co cover a closing slide. 
So again, I just want to remind everyone that the next webinar will take place in February 2023, and it will be with a new registration link. So please be on the lookout for that. We will be posting it within our newsletter whenever that comes out next, and also onto our social media. And if you would like to follow us on our social media, I will put all the links to these within the chat. And in addition, just one last thing, we will be posting the recording of this video once it downloads and we get it formatted onto our Aim Ahead YouTube channel, which I've also posted the link for that in the chat as well. So thank you everybody so much for attending today. I hope you all have a wonderful end of the year and a happy new year, and we will see you all again next year or between now and whenever you're on your social media again. All right, thank you everyone. Have a good thank one. You.